Bonjour. I am the one speaker who can't speak French. Um, so my name's Harry. I'm here to talk about 10 principles for effective front-end development. Now, I know this is um, .css, so I should really be talking about some hardcore SAS or maybe some really intricate CSS architecture. But one thing I've learned is that it's really important every now and again to just leave our tools alone, step back, and take a much broader view of what we do. So that's why I'm speaking about these principles. Uh, they're personal principles of mine. These are things that I do when I work. Uh, and every bit of work I do, regardless of the technology, the stack, the tools I use, tries to follow these principles. Uh, they're very new. I've never shared these before. Um, so I'll be interested to see what people think. Um, but that's the, kind of, that's the kind of thing I'm going for today. Less about tooling, more about approaches. Um, so yeah, my name's Harry. I'm a consultant web developer. That means that I spend a lot of time with a lot of different clients. I travel around a lot and learn about everybody's problems. I'm like a, a developer therapist. In doing this, I've realized that it doesn't matter what stacks a company uses. It doesn't matter what, which preprocessor they use. They always have similar problems that can't always be solved by specifics. And it's really important to know specifics. It's good to know Flexbox. Right? It's valuable to know about SAS. It's very, uh, very valuable to know um, different technologies. But specifics aren't always that transferable. One thing I've learned in the last few years, especially working for myself as a consultant, is that code is actually only a tiny, tiny part of what we do. Right? Think about what you do in your uh, your day-to-day -day life. You might deal with clients. You might spend a lot of time discussing uh, compromises with designers. You might spend a lot of time explaining why things can't be done to project managers. The actual code you write is a tiny, tiny part of your job. So I think it's important to realize um, that you know, focuses should shift. And mine shifted a few years ago, uh, and much, much for the better. I found that I'm a more effective developer by ignoring the specifics and trying to focus on principle-led approach to development. Um, be interested to know anyone's thoughts on this. So if you want to uh, tweet during this talk, I'd be really grateful. So I've just 10 CSS will do. Um, I know it says you know, principles for front-end development, but I only really write CSS. So all of these principles, I apply directly to CSS. Start off with an easy one. Um, the simplest option is usually the best. Uh, I got Hugo, who's speaking uh, a little later, to do some translations for me. If they're wrong, it's his fault. <laughs> the simplest option is usually the best. This seems quite obvious, right? Let's start with an obvious one. Um, the simple option is probably the cheapest to implement. The quickest and cheapest uh, option to implement will be the simplest one. This is good for business, and we'll talk about business in a second. That's, a, that's another one of my principles. Um, but quick and cheap to implement is really valuable. And it's also easier for other developers to inherit. When you pick up a system from someone and it's really complex and over-engineered, that's a horrible thing to try and work with. So always err on the side of simplicity. If you've got two or more options, two or more solutions to a problem, always try and pick the simplest. It's less likely to break, it's probably more robust, and it's just lots easier to work with. It also lessens the amount of cognitive overhead when working with a system. It's a really horrible thing to have to try and remember every moving part in a system, which leads me on to the next bit. Always try and reduce the amount of moving parts in a system. As a developer, it's very easy just to do as you're told, or it's very easy just to build the features that have been requested. I think it's really valuable to say no to a lot of things. The best code is no code at all, so it's a really good exercise for developers to get rid of unnecessary stuff. Anything that could be removed from a project, try and get rid. That could be features. You know, that could be telling a client that you know, we don't really need this feature, let's get rid of it. Or it could be actual lines of CSS. It could be reducing a 20-line mixing down into a single helper class. Right? Removing the amount of moving parts is a really valuable exercise. Every moving part in a system is a potential thing to go wrong. It's a potential point of failure. Everything you add to a system introduces the risk of something going wrong. It's easier to maintain a system with fewer moving parts. I think it's a really valuable exercise to get rid. The third principle, understand the business. Now, in this context, the business could mean a few things. If you work for an agency, the business would be your managers and the client, the person funding the project. If you work in-house, if you work for a startup or a product, um, like Kaelig at the Financial Times, the business is where you work every day. You're surrounded by the business. Understanding the business makes you a very valuable developer. It's important to understand that every bit of work you do has a cost and a value associated with it. Try and understand the financials. I don't mean you know, learning what your colleague's salary is, but perhaps knowing what the company charges you out at for a day. Right? It makes you much more effective. Understanding the cost and value of your work 
means that um, you can make very, very informed decisions about what you do for the good of the company. Don't waste other people's money. And like I said, it also makes you a much more valuable developer. Imagine a company that looks like this. And you're just a developer. You're no better than anyone else. You're no cleverer, no more important than anyone else. And unfortunately, you're probably quite replaceable. If you look around you right now, there are hundreds of people in this room who all do similar jobs. So being a regular developer who just does their bit of the, uh, the task isn't necessarily a very valuable developer to have. Um, and that sounds really cruel, but I, I, do, I do believe it's true. Um, so instead of having this position within a business, try and have this position. Try and interconnect yourself with everyone else's problems. Understand the cost and the value of your work. Uh, it makes you much more valuable. Principle number four, care less and care appropriately. Another thing I learned, in, in especially my time working in big companies, no one cares about your code more than you do. Your client doesn't care if you've used SAS or less. The business doesn't really care if you've used an inline style or not. Don't stress too much about your own work and pick the right battles for everybody else. There are a lot more people working on that team than just you. When you have, whenever you have discussions, you have to balance everybody else's needs and wants. Remain objective when you do this. Care less about your own work and care about the good of the team, the stakeholders. There's a much bigger picture out there. The bigger picture looks something like this. We have the user, the person who needs the product that you're building. The team, that would be you and your colleagues, designers, developers, uh, you know, solutions architects, UX guys. Uh, and then there's the business, the person funding this project. Now, I've worked with a lot of developers who think in this category. They think about the team. They make decisions for the team. They want to use a preprocessor because this is the one we want to use. Good developers are a bit like jugglers. Good developers will think here, the overlap. But great developers think about everybody else's overlap. Great developers are very unselfish people. And I've found this in working with different companies that the most productive teams are the people who make sacrifices themselves for the good of everybody else. So care less about your own work and care more appropriately about everybody else. The fifth of the 10 principles, pragmatism trumps perfection. It's better to have good enough working today than it is to wait for, per uh, for perfection tomorrow. Get things alive. You've always got time to make things better. Perfect is a real, real sort of um, misfire on the web anyway. Think about all the different browsers, devices, um, network connections. We will never achieve perfect, so there's, not, there's no point even trying. I worked with a client who delayed a release by nearly two weeks because the color of the nav highlight was wrong. That's insane. That's, that, is a, you know, that is a very sort of uh, edge case thing to happen. But that's expensive. Missing out on potentially two weeks of new signups because the nav was slightly the wrong color is expensive. You know, users don't care if the nav's slightly the wrong color because they never saw the PSDs. Pragmatism trumps perfection. Something hacky that works today is better than something perfect that might work next week. Never hold yourself back in the pursuit of perfection because it just slows teams down. Think at product level, right? Some of these principles seem fairly interconnected. So this is a little like thinking about the business, but thinking at product level is a really valuable thing for a developer to do. There's a very um, sort of old but harmful view that as CSS developers, it's our job just to build PSDs. And that's really, really harmful because that's not true at all. We've got to think about the performance of a code base. We need to think about the maintainability, the velocity of the team. We've got a lot more to worry about than we realize. So try not to put yourself in a bubble and, and think about the entire product. You're in a very, very valuable position. If you've started understanding the business and you're a developer so you understand the technology, you can make great decisions for that product. True story, I once worked at a company where a simple UI decision that I made saved that company hundreds of thousands of pounds. It's too long a story to get into now, but if you want to hear it over a beer, I'll let you buy me a beer. Um, but yeah, we've got a profound ability to infect, affect, not infect, affect entire products. Use that wisely. Do what's right for everyone. Seven, do not design systems around edge cases. I encounter this one quite a lot. Basically, don't let the minority lead the majority. Do not base your entire product around statistical outliers. Another example for you. I worked with a company that was making a, a mobile a website, a mobile web app. They needed a spinner, right, a little loading spinner. Now we had to accommodate a really old flavor of Android and a really old flavor of Blackberry. Now the Android didn't support CSS animations and the Blackberry didn't support CSS, CSS animations or animated GIFs. 
So the team spent nearly a month building a spinner that worked in every single browser. It was a combination of sprites, um, some horrible JavaScript, and it was really clunky and it had really bad rendering performance. And this spinner went out to 100% of our users. So even though it only needed to um, be given to a small fraction of a percentage, this spinner went out to everyone. Designing systems around edge cases is a really expensive thing to do. It can hold the quality of the product back. Solve every edge case as an edge case. Don't let it leak in and influence the entire build of a system. Number eight, another quite specific one. Don't make decisions based on anecdotal evidence. Another true story. I worked with a company who, um, they really should have been using a preprocessor. They had a big, uh, a big UI, and it would have really benefited from using SAS. And I got there, and I asked them, how come you don't use SAS? And the response was, oh, well, someone told me that variables don't work very well in SAS. Well, of course they do. Tens of thousands of people use SAS every day. Of course variables work in SAS. Did you not think to try this out yourself? And they hadn't. They hadn't thought to run their own test. They trusted a story. They trusted some gossip. Never trust stories. Always trust data. It's very expensive to ignore the numbers. Uh, another example, you're going out to eat at a restaurant and uh, you find 100 five-star reviews for this place. And then you see one two-star review. You will obviously ignore that two-star review. The two-star review is a statistical outlier. Get rid of anomalies. Always trust numbers. Try and avoid trusting anecdotes and stories. The ninth principle, don't build it until you've been asked for it. It's really tempting, especially as a CSS developer, I'm speaking personally here, to over-deliver. It's really cool to say, Oh, I've made this mix in which does this, but if you pass in this parameter, it does this. The problem is no one's asked for that. So I've spent the business's money. I've made something that I haven't paid for. I've spent an extra half day sugarcoating some, uh, some SAS. No one's asked for that, but someone's paid for it. And so it's a rephrasing of, um, yeah, you ain't gonna need it, the, the programming software engineering principle. And it's really valuable to try and follow. It can be harmful because, yeah, the cost of the initial work up front. If someone hasn't asked for a feature, don't build it because you're spending someone else's money. But also it can influence the rest of an entire project. If you build something now that has a certain dependency on a third party library, your product is now hooked into that dependency. So it might have a knock on effect with future features you want to add. Um, and yet maintaining things that no one even wanted. Imagine having to tell your manager that I had to bug fix something. Oh, what did you have to bug fix? You don't really know about it because no one asked for it, but I built it anyway and I've spent two days fixing it. It's a very unwise, irresponsible approach to building websites. Don't build anything until you've been asked for it. Solve every single problem only when you encounter it. You might be well aware that you need to support internationalization in six months' time. Do it in six months' time. Don't do any work ahead of time. Uh, expect and accommodate change. If this is the one thing that any sort of large-scale site developer should always try and do, expect and accommodate change. I've been doing this long enough to know that clients will throw you a curveball. The business will make unusual decisions. Users will request odd features. Everything is subject to change, so expect it and accommodate it. Every bit of code you write, make sure you can undo it. Make sure you can reverse decisions. Keep yourself free to change direction. Never tie yourself down. Never put yourself into a corner that you can't get out of. Everything is subject to change, so at least accommodate that. And you can use this as a really good way to just lessen the stress. I get a lot of workshop attendees asking me, oh, we really struggle to find the right name for something. You know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the right name for something. My advice is always pick something now, right? Worry about something that fixes a problem right now because it'll probably change anyway. Don't try and predict the future. Always make, make sure that you can change direction, undo things, and modify decisions that were made months ago because you will thank yourself in the long run. So just to recap, my 10 principles, my 10 personal principles for effective front-end development. Pick the simplest option. It's the quickest and the cheapest to implement. It's the easiest one to maintain. It's the one that's least likely to go wrong. No one appreciates over-engineered code. A website is not the place to show off. Reduce the amount of moving parts. Remove the amount of moving parts from a system so that it's more robust. More things going on in a system means more things that could potentially go wrong. It's a really good exercise as a developer to build less. The best code is no code at all. It's the fastest, it's the most robust, it's the easiest to debug. Understand the business. Be aware of the fact that everything you do has a cost and a value associated with it. Be responsible with other people's money. It makes you a better developer. 
in terms of actually writing CSS, but it also makes you a more employable, more valuable member of the team. If you can be less selfish and spend your employer's money wisely, you will get more effective products off the back of it, and they will appreciate that work. Uh, care less and care appropriately. Right? No one cares about your CSS more than you do. Stop being um, enclosed in a bubble and think about what you can do for everybody. Pragmatism trumps perfection. Don't be the guy who holds back a release for nearly two weeks because the nav is slightly wrong. It's expensive, it's unwise, and it doesn't help anyone. Hacking something together that works today is better than having something perfect in three weeks' time. Uh, think at product level. The knowledge you have of the product you work on allows you to make very profound and far-reaching, long-lasting decisions. Do not design systems around edge cases. Do not let the minority influence the majority of your product. Always design solutions to edge cases as edge cases themselves. There's no point weighing down the entire product to cater to a minority. Good example would be, if 5% of your revenue comes from IE7 users, do not spend 25% of your time accommodating those users. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, don't make decisions based on anecdotal evidence. Anecdotes are, by definition, edge cases. They are stories. Always trust data. Don't build it until you've been asked for it. It's tempting to build cool things before anyone needs it. But that adds bloat to the code base. It could always go wrong. You might have to maintain that for the next two years. Solve every problem as and when you encounter it. And finally, expect and accommodate change. You know full well that clients make weird decisions. They will change their mind. The business can change focus and direction. Every bit of CSS you write, every bit of code you write should facilitate that. Never tie yourself down, never put yourself into a corner. And that is me saying thank you very much for listening. Yeah.